Hello again and welcome back to the Day of Daily Bible Study. We're continuing on with the book of Acts. We're going to uh, finish up chapter 8 today. We're going to start in verse 25 and go to the end of the chapter, uh, I believe. Uh, yes. So before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we look at this remarkable story of Philip. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to see uh, what we can learn from it. See what we, uh, we have to, 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 to glean from it. And Lord, help us to be encouraged and inspired by, by his example. Lord, we ask you to watch over us as we consider this text together. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have not had to um, I go through Acts in this way before, ever. I've never gone through passage by passage by passage trying to explain it to other people. And there's something about explaining things to other people that forces you to engage with the text differently than you might if it was just you reading for your devotional purposes. When you're reading for devotional purposes, you're just kind of going through saying, Lord, speak to me whatever you have to speak to me. And, and there's things you'll catch and there's things that you won't catch and whatever. But when you're trying to explain it to somebody else, you become much more aware of the, of the details. And what I want to share with that is that I'm discovering as we're going through this that now we're seeing Philip once again uh, being a, a leader in this expanding of the of the, the church, we had Philip in Samaria back in uh, chapter or, or verse five of this passage, and then we see him as being the one whom uh, Simon was following along, uh, Simon Magus, as he follows through the through this different things. And now we here we have another story of Philip doing remarkable things. So I guess I had not realized how crucial a role uh, Philip played in the early church uh, when I was just reading it for myself, but now I keep hearing that name. So let's let's read what, had, what we had to say here about uh, an Ethiopian receiving Christ. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem, and they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in the chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and both went down to the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, the, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Uh, so I, I, I want to highlight, first of all, the most weird thing first, which is somehow, uh, you know, Philip gets whisked away. And I'm not certain that I know exactly. So let me look, look real quick. So um, Gaza is, is south, um, southwest of Jerusalem. So he's done that. And then he goes up to Caesarea. Uh, and I believe that that is... Uh, a certain degree of, of being away. I don't want to kind of spend too much time looking for Caesarea, but my recollection is that Caesarea Philippi is, is much uh, later. I'm sorry, uh, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, I'm assuming it's the same Caesarea. There might be more, more than one Caesarea, but uh, there's certainly Caesarea Philippi, which is way in the northeast of, of Jerusalem, kind of on the border even of it. So if that's the right Caesarea, then, uh, then that's where he's really transferred from one part of Israel to the entirely different part. So that's kind of the weirdest part of this, of this passage. Um, and I don't really know what to tell you about it, other than it just, it's, it's interesting. But I want to highlight a couple things. One, so uh, the, the prediction that Jesus made was that people would be his witnesses to, in Jerusalem, in Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And we've already had uh, J- Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And now we're, we have, Philip is meeting with an Ethiopian eunuch. And so he's from Africa. And he is a high-ranking official. Uh, a eunuch in the queen's um, you know, entourage, and he came up to Jerusalem, and so he's on his way back. So what this means is that now we have, by way of Philip and by way of this Ethiopian eunuch, we have uh, the gospel going to Africa uh, very, very, very early on. And it's actually very interesting and important to realize that, uh, that the gospel was in Africa long before it was ever in Europe. Uh, it was among you know, uh, dark-skinned 
uh, Jewish people and you know dark-skinned African people long before it ever was by people who look like me. And I think this is vitally important for a couple of reasons. One, because people who look like me, people who have you know fair skin, skin, blue eyes, things like that, have often used their own idea of being churched people as used as a as a means to subjugate people who look different. Uh, and also, it's important to realize because on. Um, there are some people who will talk about, well, Christianity, you know, learning about Christianity, read about Christianity, you know, Christianity is a, you know, is, is a white person's religion. Well, not in its earliest days it wasn't. And to be honest, if you look at the, the average Christian in the world today, it doesn't look like me at all. Uh, you know, there's, there's, so many African, or there's so many Africans and South Americans and Asians uh, who are Christians that it just it dwarfs how many um, Caucasian people are Christians. And so we see this starting even now, that this missionary presence in Africa starts in the first you know, months of the church. You know, certainly uh, Europe is behind, if anything. And um, so we see that. And, but also I want to highlight the fact that this is a, a, um, an Ethiopian who is somehow schooled as in the, the Old Testament. Uh, as a practicing Jew. He came to Jerusalem to worship, has experience in the Old Testament, and so he's reading the Old Testament. And I want to highlight also that when in the New Testament we read that the Scripture bears witness to Jesus, that the Scripture points us to God and what God has done in the Gospel, what we mean is they mean is the Old Testament because there was no New Testament written by the time the New Testament was written. And so it's incredibly important that we realize this person is coming to ask the questions that lead him to the inescapable answer of Jesus or ask questions to which Jesus is the most obvious and full answer uh, by reading Isaiah. Part of the reason why we, we go back to that passage of Isaiah all the time, it shows up in Holy Week and it's a Good Friday type service uh, as well. Um, so it's just vitally important to, to realize that this connection of even this missionary kind of presence back going down to Africa is not, um, is not by way of Gentiles yet. We still don't have, you know, that this person might be a Gentile by birth, but he's a Jew by persuasion, a Jew by conversion. And so we have this um, stress on everything that Jesus is doing is seen and interpreted and affirmed absolutely as being the outworking, the culmination um, of what God has been doing throughout the people of Israel and throughout the Old Testament. And so there's a strong continuity that we sometimes can miss. And so I want, I want it's, if you, we, we, have, we have been focusing a lot on the New Testament with all these things for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, not least because it's easiest to go passage by passage by passage and talk about things that matter for us every day, whereas the Old Testament is a little bit less clear on that. Um, but if you have not read the Old Testament, I would strongly encourage you to do so because there's so many things that are taken for granted in the New Testament. And I try to highlight those as we go. Uh, and there's connections that are assumed there that if we are not conversant with the Old Testament, we will simply miss. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't read the Old Testament, uh, commit yourself to doing so. Even if it's only a couple of chapters a day, maybe just one chapter a day, get yourself into the Old Testament. Uh, expose yourself to this whole Hebraic way of thinking because it is vitally important for us to understand the New Testament well. Well, that's all for today. That's all for, uh, um, for chapter 8. Uh, come back tomorrow. We'll do chapter 9. Start chapter 9 of the Book of Acts. Have a good day.